look, everything look good to everybody. Yeah. Can... Great. Terrific. Um, so uh, this is a, a um, Glenn DeVries ideas. Um, I've been wrong about a lot of stuff over the years. So take it all with a grain of salt. The point is, this is a, a not a company presentation. It's a presentation about me um, and my uh, very lucky perspective on um, the industry of life sciences, which started here uh, doing cancer research at Columbia Presbyterian. I had a a uh, bench full of RT-PCR assays, a, a refrigerator full of blood samples from patients all over our department, a shared Windows 95 PC with all of the data and SPSS and Excel. And I was walking um, and taking elevators to go to different buildings to collect all the data I needed to do the analysis. We were doing a very primitive early um, version, if you will, of thinking about uh, looking at circulating tumor cells as a way to stage disease. And the science was great, but the infrastructure to get everything together for the analysis um, that I was doing um, was just terrible. And that was really when myself and a couple other people from Columbia, both Presbyterian Hospital and Business School got together and we started Medidata. Uh, we had a really interesting, um, I think early kind of, part of the company because we were people who were researchers and physicians and statisticians and we knew um, what people wanted to use. Um, we had some early success there. Um, we took our company public in 2009 for those who pay attention to the world of finance that must look like a typo, it's not. Um, my business partner, Tarek Sharif, who's like an older brother to me, I met him through a friend um, and we've shared an office for 10 years uh, is extremely smart about markets and uh, the architecture of building a business. And uh, then fast forward to two years ago, we were acquired by Dassault Systems. Um, that's a company that has transformed a lot of industries, including aerospace and automotive, thinking about how you bring the virtual world and the real world together. And the, the reason I'm telling you all this is again, through this journey that I've had, um, I just got this amazing seat that I think almost um, nobody has unfortunately had the privilege of sharing. Um, I've worked uh, literally in one way or another in 25,000 clinical trials um, in every therapeutic area. Um, you have a 50-50 chance, probably better, of uh, if you're taking a prescription drug or prescribing one, it's one that Medidata um, actually moved the data around or helped do the analyses for. Um, and you have a much higher percentage chance of that um, if you have taken a COVID-19 vaccine, which I hope you have, but we worked on all that too. So let's go back to high school biology. <laughs> and that's kind of where my journey started. And I just think it's an important piece of background for us to all ground on as we think about the, the process of, of clinical development. Um, and again, there are people on the call who know quite well that this is uh, slightly hyperbolic, but the fact of the matter is your genotype just doesn't change. Um, it certainly changes, you know, in, in a cancer cell, um, but we're largely carrying around the exact same genes we were born with. And the point that we're trying to make is that there is no additional information that you get from genotype over time. Again, having looked at all of the infrastructure and the methods that have been in clinical trials over the years, um, I think what we're really getting to is a, a much deeper appreciation of this. And that is that the way we need to think about human health is very much a multi-scale problem. Uh, again, I hope I'm preaching to the choir around this, but it goes from that genotype at a molecular level up into cells, systems, organs, and ultimately, and I think importantly, um, our, our cognition and our resultant behavior uh, is all part of what defines us from a health perspective. Frankly, it's a lot of what we want to measure from an outcomes perspective, especially in the new world that we're going to talk about, is on the right side of this graph, right? People, people are much, I'm not talking about pharma companies, I'm talking about people are much more interested in outcomes that are related to their ability to think and act than they are in what's going on in biological systems in their bodies. Um, so the environment that is around all of these different levels is just as important as the levels themselves. And, and the metaphor that I like to think about um, in terms of, of this, when you're designing an experiment uh, around safety and efficacy and value is the Rosetta Stone. Um, everything I just showed you, the molecular systems 
um, that result in people's ability to live a, a happy, healthy life. And the person wants to help a healthy life. They don't care that they have a, a P53 mutation. Um, but those things are all adding up to the same story, right? The Rosetta Stone has three stories in, sorry, one story in three different languages. And because it is consistent in terms of the story, it allows us to create translations that we couldn't make before. It allows us to, in the case of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, decipher them and, and to understand what they mean. Well, that's why this is a good metaphor. It allows us to really think about what can we decipher from anything that is in genotype, anything that is a molecular phenotype, and can we associate that with something that is much more high level. Another element of what I'll walk you through that I think is so important is around the fact that we have operated with some terrible assumptions in healthcare and certainly in, in life sciences and clinical trials, uh, and they were exposed um, because of a pandemic. Not the topic that I uh, came to talk about today, but certainly if there are questions one I'm very interested in, I think this all has to do with, uh, and that is equity and access in healthcare. Um, if you look in clinical trials, it's a very passionate topic for myself and a bunch of other people from MediData. You know, it's mostly rich white people who live near academic medical centers. Um, and it's because of that proximity and also things like the amount of time that it takes to go get a therapy. Do you have childcare? Do you have a job that you need to uh, be at? And actually, I think this idea that we don't want to have to put people in the same room at the same time is incredibly important in terms of solving that. What I'm seeing from this perspective that I've gotten through MediData is that these categories are not going to remain distinct um, for very long, and we're already starting to see them blend. And so I think when we talk about digital therapies, yes, there's the app that interacts with you and gets you to change your behavior or um, change patterns in your cognition, but there is also the device that is going to dose a patient based on something that is measurable and there is code and there is an app. And by the way, there's plenty of examples of that in the real world in diabetes, but we are gonna see that in lots of different therapeutic areas. We are going to see molecules that um, had to be uh, given to a patient in a clinic with a complex inf um, infusion as an example that are now going to be something that goes to the patient and can be delivered at home. We are gonna see as part of that much more complexity entering into the processes of manufacturing and supply chain. I've only had this additional view from my seat in the last two and a half years as part of being acquired by Dassault Systems, um, but the company is deeply in manufacturing and logistics, including in the life sciences world. And as we think about therapies that use new classes of ingredients, those classes being things like cells from the patient that you're trying to treat in a cell therapy, these are very complicated things to start to think about and manage. Um, and in many cases, the delivery is going to not just include things that happen in the clinic or it happen in somebody's home, but start in the clinic and start in somebody's home. And the application of digital technologies, therefore, is going to go literally from bedside to bench to bedside, just like the biology, and include things like diagnostics, um, just the stuff that I was doing 25 years ago at Columbia in terms of figuring out what patients were supposed to get the right treatments um, in, with prostate cancer, clinical decision support, and then the actual delivery and monitoring for patients. So I do think that a sensible abstraction for the world of life sciences is to, to think about the industry as tool makers. Healthcare is performed with tools. But those prescriptions, those purchases, those surgical tools, these are, these are things that are made um, that are used to deliver healthcare outcomes. And that leads to thinking about precision, I think, in a, a very useful way. We are trying to make tools that are used in more and more specific instances, right? The precision in medicine, ultimately personalization, give the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. And we'll come back to that concept. Why? Well, one is that the more precise we are, or the more precise that we attempt to be, the harder it is to find patients who will benefit from it. 
right? If you, if you have a personalized therapy, if you have a, a, a CAR T therapy that was made for somebody else and you give it to me, um, at, at best, it is not effective and it is likely unsafe. The more extensive it is, the more precise we're trying to be, the harder it is to find people who ultimately could be prescribed it and benefit from it. And in some cases, even harder. And Stan brought up how important recruiting it is, is in this world. It's very difficult to find patients who might be able to be enrolled in a trial to test its, its safety and efficacy. Also, by definition, every time we add something to inclusion exclusion criteria, it's something that we're gonna measure in a research study, something that might wind up in a label, that's more data, right? There's more complexity. And this abundance of data means that we have to not just be able to collect it and have the infrastructure to manage it. If you're looking at behavior and using a sensor as part of um, your therapeutic or part of a research program or a monitoring program around your therapeutic, that's a lot of data. If you look at those life size, those healthcare tools, as I said, um, from that perspective, then the tool makers are actually the ones who probably have the biggest influence possible on a lot of the future of healthcare. If the life sciences industry does not create better cures for newer, for new or different cancers, well, there's nothing for the clinician to, to do when the patient walks in with that particular condition. And so I see this as something about research, but also about making sure that the future of medicine is more precise. And I wanna give you two important concepts about the extension of what I just showed you. Um, one is this idea of, if anybody knows about um, building bridges, it's like a civil engineering problem. If you have a, a giant chasm and you wanna build a bridge, the hardest thing to do is get the first steel cable over that chasm. It's pretty easy from there. You just kind of shuttle back and forth more and more of the bridge and infrastructure. And before you know it, you've got a, a big thick cable and then you can add another cable. And it's not maybe not trivial, but the really hard part is getting things from one end to the other. And when I say that I see a lot of naivete about large scale data and what to do with it, it really has to do with this. And so it, it actually doesn't help you having all that data or having all these techniques that are theoretically useful unless you can create this steel thread and go from having the data that you need that is cleaned and standardized in a way that you can apply the right techniques to it to get something of real value out of the back end from a scientific or from a business perspective. This is where one of the big pitfalls that um, whether you're an academic or you're working in a corporation, people have around data. They think there is a linear relationship between the data that you've got, the amount of effort you put in and the value you're gonna create from that data. And it is just incorrect because it does not account for that steel thread that I just talked about. And what you really have to think about is getting that data that is the right necessary data. You have to do a lot of standardization to make sure that it is not going to be garbage fed into an algorithm, whether it's a sexy machine learning one or a super simple statistical calculation. You need to make sure you've got clean data going in so you get a good conclusion coming out. And this, the kind of bottom of this curve is where so many people lose their appetite. They run out of money, they run out of time, they run out of gumption before they start to climb the value creation curve. Um, this is some work that we did at Medidata. It's a couple of years old now, um, this, this uh, ASCO poster, but actually we've, we've continued to do this in multiple therapeutic areas. Um, what we did is we created a uh, synthetic control arm, which is not really a great description. It makes it sound like it's not real. Um, but what we can do is take this problem of patient scarcity and make it going go away um, by making our denominator with patients bigger in new ways, ways that frankly require a lot of patience and money from a data standardization perspective. Um, we can now remember, I've worked with many data on 25,000 of them. So you go find the ones in glioblastoma, which are the ones that are similar in design 
to the study that you are prospectively doing. And you then get rid of all the patients who have gotten whatever the, the particular um, experimental therapy is and just look at the control patients. So there is a lot of trials that try to do um, things and the people who were getting standard of care and the control arms um, passed away. Uh, and like, can't, can't, can't we use that data again? Don't we have an ethical obligation to those patients who volunteered to use that data again? And I think the answer um, to both of those is yes. And what you can do is take that, those patients, and although they've come from different clinical trials, with enough effort, you can start to standardize that data. And once you have done that, you can now take your prospective set of data and actually use a new comparator. And um, you ultimately can create the exact same kind of of tables, listings, and figures that you would with two prospective data sets, um, but you can use a synthetic control. And this is a little bit too subtle on the slide, I apologize, but instead of having the one-to-one -one ratio below prospective experimental therapy and prospective standard of care controls, you have the potential to maybe even go to zero, but certainly to have less than a one-to-one -one ratio. And the upside to that of to a patient, again, from an ethical perspective, is we're going to expose fewer people to something that is harmful or not effective in research. We are also going to get through a research project with scarce patients that much faster because we can find fewer of them. And that allows us to get something that is useful on the market that much faster. And again, that has, um, like many good things in life sciences, um, both commercial um, and ethical positive implications. Let's take another step at this. So this is uh, data from some, I think it was some McKinsey report or something like that. Uh, we're not that great as an industry of going from, from concept to product. Actually, when, when we were being, uh, Metadata was being acquired by uh, uh, Dassault Systems, um, I met with their CEO and I think they acquired Metadata because um, they'd done all this stuff, as I said, in aerospace and automotive and transformed the way people really thought about product life cycles and management. And, um, and they really want to be able to do that in life sciences. Like, how is it that like one out of 10 things that you intend to deliver from a therapeutic perspective actually work? Like that ratio is terrible. And this is really a, a problem um, that has to do with that scarcity um, that I mentioned and also has to do with that complexity. How do we figure out who the right people are when we have these more complex therapeutics. And that is where our friend Thomas Bayes comes in. And the ultimate application of this Bayesian thinking in a research project is uh, in a clinical trial that is designed to be adaptive from a Bayesian perspective. The way this works, right, is you, you enroll a new patient and you don't know what drug they're gonna get. Remember, we're trying to give the right drug to the right patient at the right time. When I was doing my Columbia research, we were taking patients who were gonna go have a radical prostatectomy, which is not exactly a pleasant procedure now, but 25 years ago, you were you know, opened from stem to stern and um, you know, half the people who had the surgery came out incontinent, half came out impotent, some came out with both of those conditions. And for some people, um, one or the other or both were permanent. Um, and then you would discover five years later that you still had prostate cancer because it had metastasized and we could detect it. So you enroll new patients, you measure where it says biomarkers measured here. Yes, right now, a lot of that is um, genetic biomarkers in these kinds of studies, but there is no mathematical reason why it can't be anything on the multi-scale Rosetta Stone. So we could look at things around behavior, we could look at things around blood chemistry, um, but you now have your opinion based on all the previous coin flips. I always worry that people think I'm trivializing patients to coin flips. I'm not, I'm just using that as a mathematical framework. Um, but you try to figure out, can you predict what is going to be of not drug and standard of care, but standard of care maybe for a few patients, but an array of different therapies or different combinations of therapies. Let's try to match Glenn, the new patient, with the best therapy, and then let's measure those outcomes for Glenn, update our Bayesian model, and the next time a patient comes in, 
we will know that much more because we just got to flip the coin again. Uh, again, hopefully you believe me on that one. And what does this mean here? I'm, I've now again, slightly subtly updated my denominators in this page. So we've gone with a individual, right? Some group ratio says one, who are getting this potential new therapy. We've got a set of controls that are prospectively enrolled, which is fewer than one, hopefully trending towards zero. We found, this is just metadata, um, anecdotal information, but 10 to 100 times the number of patients from a comparator perspective by looking at people who have been enrolled in uh, contemporaneous or, or old, older clinical trials in the same indication. And if we do something in an adaptive world, we're actually going to have two, five, 10, 20 X, the number of patients who are getting other experimental therapies that we can use to compare to the current therapy that prospective patient number one was given me in that example. We are effectively increasing our denominator. That's why we're extending this page. So in a clinical trial, one of the great things, one of the reasons that it's possible to do that um, kind of synthetic controls that I was describing before is you get a lot of data. You get a, a really big sample of that multi-scale view of any individual patient. So that's why um, the, the y-axis here is data depth. The green clinical trial box are the tall ones. There's more data about those patients. That's great. Unfortunately, in a clinical trial, um, we don't know that patient for a long time. That is one of the reasons why looking in patients' charts in quote unquote real world patients who are just being treated in a particular therapeutic area is a great place to get more longitudinal views of what happens from a therapeutic or, or a health arc to patients with any particular disease. Why do I have all this here? Because I wanna extend our denominator and allow us to, to think differently. And what we can do is really take that standardized real world data and to the extent that we can match it with clinical trial data, we can take this big mess and we can start to line it up in different ways. And what I've done here is I've kind of lined it up based on um, patients who have had a progression event. It seems like even patients who didn't progress in the clinical trial look like patients who in a short period of time after their health arc looked like it did in the clinical trial did progress. There's one patient um, again, this is an entirely theoretical example in the middle of the screen where the patient who was in the clinical trial looks like a real world patient and nothing happened to that patient from a progressive perspective for a long time. Again, I have no labels for what the units are here. It's just a thought experiment. But in this thought experiment, I think it's really important to realize there are ways to bridge these data sets. There are also companies that are doing wonderful things. Um, around tokenizing patients in clinical trials and real world charts to bring these data sets together. Um, I think that is an equally wonderful thing. Um, ultimately, what this means is whether you use the technique I was describing or you're using tokenization, from a therapeutic safety and efficacy perspective, we now can jump a whole order of magnitude in terms of the data that we bring in to our analyses. An example that I love is some work that uh, we, we've been lucky enough to do at, uh, at Medidata with the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. Um, so this is not a big data thing. This is with like dozens of patients. But by stacking that data, organizing it, standardizing it, um, and then adding proteomic analysis, we were actually able to subtype Castleman disease, a rare disease, and take an, an on-market therapeutic that had about a one in five chance of working for any given patient and actually be able to predict who was going to benefit from it and get a 65% efficacy rate by ch changing the criteria by which we would prescribe it. Like this is literally precision medicine happening. Um, and, and I think this idea of virtuous cycles is something that is incredibly important to think about as you think about therapeutic development programs. Even if you go back to the first thing I told you about, data reuse in and of itself creates this um, beautiful virtuous cycle. I mean, I, I would love to, to for the, the disease we're talking about, for the indication we're talking about, put ourselves out of business from a virtuous cycle perspective because we've, we've cured it. Um, but up to that, 
every time we create a new tool for trying to treat that disease, we are comparing that new tool to nothing, a placebo, um, or the current standard of care. Hopefully we prove that this new tool is better. Once we do, there are people who are gonna say, well, let's try to create a new, better tool still. Well, all the people who are now getting this treatment that's new, that's the new standard of care. So we are, if we're smart about this, we're constantly adding data to these denominators that we can use um, with any of the techniques and, and many more that we've gone through and create this virtuous cycle. Had we thought about data reuse and standardization, maybe we could have even looked in research data and seen looking at patients with cancer and diabetes and heart conditions, all of a sudden more analgesic use, more fevers. We actually might've been able to put together a much more sophisticated phase diagram for how we think about therapeutic selection or risk in COVID-19 if the world of healthcare had its act together about this. And so hopefully that's kind of um, uh, something that gets you guys excited and inspires the way you, you think about therapeutic um, program design, because again, you have to get your mind into the space where this is not a two-dimensional graph, it's an n-dimensional graph, but there are, as you assemble data, phase shifts and finding those lines where, where water goes from, from liquid to vapor, those, these are the lines where, oh, this is a patient who, um, I'll go back to my research, maybe is a great candidate to have their prostate removed. And actually the, the tumor is isolated and removing the prostate will be a curative measure. But maybe if the patient is really close to a particular line that we can detect, there, they, it might be too close to that line for us to, to say confidently this is a patient where the radical prostatectomy will be curative. Maybe we need to think about um, doing that and giving them some kind of chemotherapy or using the chemotherapy instead. Or in the case of prostate cancer, maybe this is a patient who um, doesn't need to be treated at all because it, this is an instance that's very slow growing. So experimental therapy, existing therapies, combination therapies, this kind of mapping and thinking about the data you're generating, what is the impact of a, a companion digital therapeutic to something that is molecular or mechanical in nature? How do we measure that? You have to, I think, think about data in this way. And it's really kind of the, the main thought that I'm hoping to leave you with is that, is that that view, that phase diagram view of your research data gives you a predictive model that you can bring into the real world. You can continue to hone in the real world and that will also stay relevant as new data becomes available and added to it. I, I, I love using this example as kind of the, the final um, exclamation point on it. And then I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I see there's at least a couple things in the chat, which I can't read. So here's the bad news. Like once you're in your late twenties, you know, maybe even earlier, not that we can right now, but if we were to cut open your brains, we would find evidence of, of the amyloid plaques that are uh, at least coincident, if not causal, um, from an Alzheimer's disease perspective. And, and I won't open up the Pandora's box of, of causal or coincidental with this group. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's at least coincidental. And so I can see group of students that uh, a lot of you, um, are already on a path that mathematically I can pretty much 100% associate with dementia. Sorry. The good news is most of you will die from heart disease or cancer first. And that is a real illustration in a visceral, um, slightly morbid, but comedic way um, of looking at this diagram. And, and I think it's really the ultimate manifestation of this idea around precision medicine. It's being just as disciplined about what not to do as what to do. If I am on a therapeutic, if, if I'm on a health course, looking at all the, the multi-scale levels for the, the plaques that we can detect in my brain, the genes that are being turned on or turned off and expressed, my actual behavior, how many times I check my phone to look at my calendar because I'm forgetting or remembering what I'm supposed to do next, looking at all those things, if we can create that, that um, steam table 
um, phase transition view of the world, we can start to not just look at that mathematical construct, but we can look at people's voyage through that mathematical construct. How quickly am I moving towards the phase transition to dementia? Because if I am moving more quickly towards the phase transition to dementia or needing to take a particular drug, hopefully somebody on this call will, will be doing great things in Alzheimer's disease, um, great, I should be treated. If I am not moving towards that transition to dementia as quickly as I'm moving to the transition to um, a, a cardiac incident or a, a um, metastatic cancer, then maybe we're looking at the wrong thing and actually in the economic and the medical effects of trying to treat my Alzheimer's are not going to have positive outcomes. And so I, I think this is kind of one other dimension um, that you can look at. Again, thank you so much um, for your attention.